Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome you here on behalf of the Dunhuang Foundation today. We know many of you have navigated time zone and connectivity issues, especially this afternoon, to join us for today's lecture. We'd like to express our deep gratitude for your continued support. It truly means so much to us. Um, it's my great honor today to introduce our speaker, Dr. Lok Yu Ping. Lok Yu Ping is the Basil Gray Curator for Chinese Paintings, Prints, and Central Asian Collections at the British Museum. Previously, she was a curator of the Chinese collections at the Victoria and Albert Museum, project curator of the British Museum exhibition, Ming, 50 Years That Changed China, and assistant professor at Lingnan University in Hong Kong. She received her PhD at the University of Oxford, and her publications have mainly focused on empresses in China. She is currently working on an exhibition about the Silk Roads, a topic that is near and dear to our hearts here. Dr. Luck's topic this afternoon will be the Stein Collection from the Library Cave, Dunhuang, in the British Museum. Without further ado, please join me now in welcoming her. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much, Julia, for the introduction uh, and to the Dunhuang Foundation for the invitation to take part in this webinar series. I've been enjoying the talks from the series myself, so I'm very happy to be able to take part in them. Um, my thanks also to uh, Professor Susan Huang, who actually put me in touch with the foundation uh, in the first place, and I want to thank all of you for joining me today. I'm relatively new to the field of Dunhuang studies, um, but I, what I thought I could try and do today is to give an overview of the Stein Collection from the Library Cave in the British Museum, with a focus on the paintings and prints, and with some reference to the textiles. And I hope that will be helpful to people who are interested in learning more about this material. So let me share my PowerPoint with you. So this is what I will cover in today's talk. As you can see, it's quite a lot to get through, but um, I'm hoping to this will be an overview of the collection and a starting point for us, uh, for, for all of us for further exploration. I'll start with a, a brief introduction to the activities of Stein at Dunhuang. Um, I'm not going to go into uh, Dunhuang and Mogao Caves and, the, uh, and uh, that rat farm because I assume that is, has been covered in other talks and everyone here is, is familiar with that. Um, I'll talk about the division of the collection first uh, with the government of India, but um, this is in fact not the only early division of the collection that took place. Um, so I'll say a little bit more about that. Then there is a further division with the British Library, and uh, these divisions help us understand why certain objects ended up in the British Museum. I'll then address a question that seemed very obvious, and that is how many K-17 paintings and prints are there in the British Museum? Now this may seem like a straightforward question, but, um, but actually it's a little bit more complicated than it might appear. So I'll try and explain why that is the case. And after that, I will turn to the collection itself, and I'll quickly survey the painting collection according to their formats. And there are other ways of categorizing the painting collection, but I personally find the formats to be quite a helpful way of visualizing the collection as a whole. And then I will consider some common questions about the collection and try to provide some answers based on existing research. So for example, who made these paintings and prints and who paid for them and why? Um, there's obviously a lot that, we, that is unknowable because it's simply not recorded in history, but there is enough information uh, available that scholars have gathered to give us some idea of, uh, of this. And then finally, I'm going to turn to the textiles and introduce some of the recent scientific analysis done by BM colleagues. Uh, and this includes a small project that I worked on recently with the scientists at the BM. In 1900, Wang Yuanlu, a Taoist monk and the self-appointed caretaker of the Mogao Caves, 
discovered a hidden room while clearing out sand from one of the caves. The Mogao caves had fallen in dis into disrepair over the centuries, and Wang made it his mission to restore the site. This hidden room, later known as Cave 17 or the Library Cave, measures around 2.9 meters squared and 2.7 meters high. It was packed from floor to ceiling with tens of thousands of manuscripts together with paintings, textiles, and other objects. It is believed that the cave was sealed sometime in the early 11th century and for reasons that remain much debated. And one explanation that has been given is that it was uh, sealed in response to the fall of the, uh, of the kingdom of Khotan to uh, Muslim forces in 1006. After the discovery of this cave, Wang Yunlu began to give away items from the cave to raise awareness and funds for the restoration of the site. Although it seems for several years there was not much response, and probably because the officials and scholars that Wang approached had other more pressing concerns, and Wang may have been reticent about the full extent of his discovery. Nonetheless, news of the discovery of the hidden cave spread, and in May 1907, Mark Orlstein, the British Hungarian scholar, explorer, and archaeologist, arrived at the site with his Chinese assistant, Xiang Xiaowan. With the help of Xiang Xiaowan, Stein managed to persuade Wang Yunlu to sell him, and I quote Stein, 50 bundles of Chinese and five of Tibetan text rolls, besides all of my selections from the mixed bundles which had passed through my hands. He later mentions that this group of items that he acquired constituted around 1,200 items. And for this, he paid four silver ingots. This transaction remains controversial and Stein has subsequently been much criticized for his uh, collecting activities. So what did Stein mean by these mixed bundles? As you can see from old photographs, including the photograph on the left of Paul Pelio in the cave, the objects in cave 17 were originally kept in bundles and piled on top of each other in the cave. Stein identified what he called regular library bundles and mixed or miscellaneous bundles. The regular bundles include rolls of Chinese manuscripts and Tibetan potis, while the mixed bundles were of regular shape, containing paintings, fragments of manuscripts, pieces of banners, and papers of all kinds, including those written in different languages. It was the fragmentary and mixed content of these bundles that led Stein to speculate that K-17 served as a kind of repository for sacred waste, that is, items that were no longer used but could not be disposed of due to their significance as sacred objects. According to Stein, Wang Yunlu valued the sutra texts written in Chinese the most. And even though Wang was not well educated, he recognized the cultural significance of early texts written in Chinese calligraphy. But this prioritization gave Stein the opportunity to acquire many of the mixed bundles containing paintings and manuscripts written in different languages. Unfortunately, we don't have photographs of the paintings from K-17 in their original bundles. But here we have an example of a painting from K-17 in the British Museum that has been kept in the state as it arrived without conservation. And you can see that it is a painting that has been folded uh, and then it seemed to have been rolled up. This also gives us an indication of the considerable efforts in conservation that was needed in order to make these paintings viewable and safe for handling. After this initial acquisition from Cave 17, Stein would purchase many more manuscripts from Wang Yunlu through Jiang Xiaowan after he left Dunhuang, and also in his subsequent expedition to Northwest China in 1913-16. But the material from K-17 that is now kept in the British Museum came from this initial visit that he made in 1907. Following on from Stein, French, uh, Japanese, and Russian scholars and explorers arrived at Dunhuang 
and also acquired objects from K-17. The Qing government purchased manuscripts from Wang Yanlu as well, and these were taken to Beijing. And by the time the American Langdon Warner arrived in Dunhuang in the beginning of 1924, he found that K-17 had already been emptied. Today, the material from Cave 17 is located in many different institutions around the world. And to find out more about this, like others, I would recommend that you take a look at the International Dunhuang Project website, which provides useful introductions to various collections. This is also a convenient platform where you can search for images across institutions, although it should be noted that the entries themselves are not all up to date. In the case of BM objects, you can also, of course, search the British Museum collections online using key terms or the museum number. The museum number for paintings and prints from K17 collected by Stein in the BM repeat the numbering 1919,0101,0 and the unique number, referring to the official accession date of the collection in the museum. In some publications, this is simplified to sign and then the unique number. And this is also what I have followed in this PowerPoint. Textiles and other objects have a different numbering system. And this follows MAS dot and the unique number. MAS stands for Mark Oral Sign. However, just note that not every item following these numberings are from Dunhuang. A lot of groundwork on the collection at the BM have been done by my colleague, Helen Wang, and also Roderick Whitfield, who published a three volume catalog in 1982-83 uh, <laughs> that forms the basis for the information on our collections online. There is of course a lot of um, new research that continues to appear. So it is an ongoing process to try and update the uh, catalog entries. And here we see a, a list of further readings that is available on the British Museum website. Before I continue, it should be noted that while this talk focuses on material from Cave 17, the so-called Stein collection at the BM goes well beyond the Mogao Caves, since Stein made four expeditions to Northwest China, exploring sites around the Tarim Basin in 1900, 1906, in 1913 and 1930, which was an expedition that was cut short. There are around 1,500 archeological finds from Stein's expeditions um, that are now kept under the Asia department in the British Museum. And here we see a selection of objects in that collection. Um, a, a good selection of this material is on permanent display in um, the Sir Joseph Hotong Gallery of China. However, this is really too much to cover in one talk, and it will have to be a topic for another occasion. And today I'm going to focus on the material from K17, the Mogao caves that are in the BM. So the objects collected by Stein in his second Chinese Central Asian expedition, including the material from K17, were sent to London and kept in the British Museum for sorting and initial conservation work. Stein's second expedition was funded uh, three-fifths by the government of India and two-fifths by the British Museum, with the understanding that he would be acquiring objects that then would be divided between the two sponsors approximately according to this proportion. It took some time for an agreement to be reached on how to divide the collection. A list was approved in 1915, but the process of the physical move was delayed by the First World War the items allocated to India were eventually shipped by 1919. So a large part of the collection uh, of the paintings in India have been published in this catalog. There's also a catalog for the textiles. And it has been observed that the majority of the paintings with Chinese inscriptions ended up staying in the British Museum. And more of the paintings on silk also stayed in London, while many of the paintings on hemp and paper went to India. Some works that show a strong connection to India were also sent there. A notable example is a very large painting depicting a series of auspicious images uh, called Rui Xiang. These are Buddhist icons that have unusual origins and are surrounded by legend. 
So in this work, uh, uh, it's made up of the series and uh, of these icons, uh, and many of them are actually depicting Buddhist icons that are located in places far from Dunhuang. Like the one on the right is depicting an icon that is apparently from central India. So these pieces were sent to India and only a few fragments like the one in the center were kept in the museum. So this is one instance where pieces from the same work ended up in two different institutions as a result of the division of the collection. Furthermore, not all of Stein's collection items from Cave 17 that were selected uh, or allocated to uh, the government of India ended up being shipped there. Some textiles and paper items from Cave 17 ended up being uh, kept at the V&A in London on loan where they have been made. And recently, I learned more about a print dated 947 from the Stein collection in the BM that ended up in the Royal Ontario Museum. There had been a, a collection entry on this uh, online, but I only learned more about it when the curator there uh, from Rom actually contacted me about this work. And this print, as I found out, was given to Rom in 1927 in exchange for three bronze belt fittings, one of which you see uh, on screen here. And this painting was, oh, sorry, this print was considered a duplicate by the British Museum at the time as there, were se there are several copies of this print in the collection. So I still need to find the records that would give more reasoning and the thinking behind this rather extraordinary exchange. So I think there's more work to be done about this early um, division of the collection and where things went. The next major division of the collection occurred after the British Library was newly established as a separate institution from the BM and around 14,000 manuscripts were transferred there. The basic principle of this division was that the text would go to the BL and Victoria works, including textiles, would, go, would stay in the British Museum. So as a result of this, we have these main types of objects from K17 that were kept in the BM. Uh, most of it is paintings and textiles, but this division is not always clear cut because for example, there can be images in manuscripts. And a famous example of this is a copy of the Diamond Sutra, the earliest dated complete printed book, um, which has a date of 868, and it has this frontispiece. And this is now in the British Library, although I think a lot of people still think this is in the British Museum. Oh, in some instances, texts and images that were originally part of the single work again became separated. So this painting is one example. Originally, there are 13 paper fragments with text on them that were pasted on the back of this painting. These pieces of paper were apparently used to conserve the painting to consolidate areas of weakness on the silk support. These pieces of paper were removed in conservation in the early decades of the 20th century and later transferred to the British Library because they contained textual information that is unrelated to the painting. So here we have one of these fragments. Um, this is showing the front and back, so it's the same uh, piece. You can clearly see that it's actually cut from a larger document because the text is incomplete. But the text does give us various information, like it gives us a date, it, it mentions a monk. It seems to be a document about the distribution of millet. Fortunately, all the pieces still have Stein's original numbering written on them. In here, this is upside down. And this has enabled Professor Ron Xinjiang of Peking University to identify that they were once part of the same object. So this is an interesting example of recycling in the Dunhuang area, and also an example of early painting conservation. It also highlights the importance of really thinking about the collection as a whole across institutions, but also the challenges of doing this. So how many paintings and prints from K17 are there in the British Museum? And how many are there in total? I often get asked this question. It's possible to come up with a number based on published catalogues, particularly uh, Arthur Whaley's catalog of paintings recovered from Dunhuang by Sir Earl Stein, published in 1931. It's a convenient reference because it's, it's divided into two parts. It has the ones that were 
items that were kept in the British Museum using the museum uh, numbering and then the ones sent to India. So based on this and other catalogues, a scholar in China has compiled the following numbers. Now, this list probably needs to be updated a little bit as more information becomes available, but it does give us an overall impression of where things are mainly held. So uh, you can see that most of the material is in um, the British Museum, the National Museum of India in New Delhi, uh, the Musée Guimet in Paris, and the State Hermitage in Museum in St. Petersburg, with some items in other collections. This makes a total of around 1,049 paintings. The scholar further counted paintings that were found inside manuscripts uh, and uh, found that as part of manuscripts and added this to the total and uh, coming to a final estimate of around 1,700 items. And this is a relatively small number compared to the tens of thousands of manuscripts that were kept in K-17. So that seems to be dealt with. So the question is answered. Um, but actually, at least for the BM part of the overall collection, um, this is actually a bit more complicated than this. And I suspect this is also the case for other institutions as well. If you search on the cur uh, current BM museum database, you will actually find more painting and print entries from Cave 17 than this number. And according to my recent search, there are uh, 426 items under Chinese flats from Cave 17, Mogao Caves, Dunhuang. So how do we explain this discrepancy? The difference comes from fragments that were not included in Whaley's catalog, perhaps because they were too fragmentary for detailed cataloging. And some examples actually have recognizable content. Um, for example, we see here an uh, image of a bodhisattva. On the right, you see um, parts of, a, of a figures. Um, but they don't, uh, it's not clear enough that they can be attributed to a specific subject matter. Then there are also tiny fragments like this. And it's further complicated by the fact that some small fragments like we see here are grouped together and given one single museum number um, for convenience. Then there are instances when fragments were found to be part of the same object, and these were subsequently grouped together and remounted as one work. But the original numbering of the fragments have been kept in order to retain the, the historical information about these fragments. So this is one example of this. This is a painting that um, were remounted and made up of multiple fragments, um, each with their individual uh, museum number. So this is why the question of how many paintings from Cave 17 are there in the BM is really not as straightforward as it may first appear. Uh, but everything at least is available and searchable online and people can see for themselves what is actually in the collection. Okay, so now let's take a closer look at the collection of the portable paintings in the BM collection. These paintings are painted on uh, silk, uh, hemp, or rami that are both, both kind of coarser plant fibers and paper. With few exceptions, these have been dated to the 8th to 10th centuries, with the majority of which are dated to the 9th and 10th centuries. In terms of local Dunhuang history, this actually covers the period when the Tang Dynasty controlled, uh, controlled Dunhuang the Tibetan period uh, from 786 to 848, when the Tibetan Empire took over the region, and the period of the Guijun or the Return Allegiance Army. This is when the region was nominally loyal to dynasties in China proper, but the region was really functioning like an independent kingdom. And this Guijun period lasted nearly 200 years until it was conquered by the Sisya of Tangut. In terms of formats, the, I'm sorry, the paintings can be divided into uh, different formats. Uh, and the majority of the paintings are either these banners or fan and or hanging paintings. And then there are a smaller number of items in other formats. And I'm going to quickly run through these here. So banners or fan have a distinctive shape. 
Typically, they have a triangular top with a loop at the apex for hanging and streamers on the sides uh, and at the bottom of the painting. This uh, famous painting portraying the guiding bodhisattva, or Yilu Pusa, uh, leading the soul of a deceased lady to paradise shows one of the ways that a banner can be hung, that is on a pole and in a procession, that is a movement. Uh, and also in this case, it shows a banner in a funerary context. But there are a variety of banners. Some are made entirely of textiles, as you see on the left. And there are also examples that are extremely long, like the one on the right, which I can only show a, a small section of because it's eight meters in length. And so such a banner could only be hung from a tall structure, perhaps a building of some kind. Because of the narrow shape, banners are well suited to the depiction of a single deity such as a bodhisattva or a guardian king. Another common subject matter is the life of the Buddha, as we see in the uh, example on the right, which is incomplete and it has lost its order components. But you can see that the painter has used the long and narrow format of the banner to depict two scenes that is part of a narrative sequence. And because only a few scenes can be painted on a banner at a time, multiple banners tell telling the story would have been created and displayed as a set. So banners like these could be used in religious rituals, including in processions, as was suggested earlier. And they could be used to mark sacred spaces, and um, they are thought to generate auspicious responses by their presence and movement if they're placed outdoors. And they could also be presented as a kind of votive offering to honor Buddhist deities, for the donor to gain merit and to express prayers. Another large group of objects in the collection are hanging paintings. They differ from the fan banners in that they have a more regular rectangular shape and usually have a border around the four sides made up of strips of textiles. And then some of them actually show loops along the top border that is used for hanging, like here. So this suggests that uh, the paintings with these loops were either hung along a taut rope or some kind of rod. These can range from quite small sizes, like the one on the left is um, about uh, 56 uh, centimeters high, and then on the right is a, a much bigger work. Often these hanging paintings will also include small donor figures in the lower part of the painting, either as a separate ba band or next to the central deity. The painting on the right shows one of the notable subject matter of hanging paintings found on, in Cave 17, that is the Sutra Transformation or Jing Bian. These are complex pictorial compositions that represent content from sutras. Uh, and like this example, the Sutra Transformation can depict a paradise scene in the center showing the Buddha preaching uh, and narrative scenes in columns on the two sides. We don't know exactly how these paintings were hung or used, but visually there is a clear connection between the sutra transformations depicted on large portable paintings and wall paintings of this subject matter at Dunhuang. Um, and for those of you who are familiar with the catalog of the Dunhuang exhibition at the Getty will recognize this comparison. The similarity of the composition suggests that paintings on silk um, of this subject matter may be conceived of as portable versions of wall paintings and could be hung in temples. And conversely, the wall paintings of this type of composition could be considered the permanent rendering of portable paintings as offerings in the caves. Here is an intriguing uh, example in the collection of a pair of paintings that I've included in this category of hanging paintings, but they don't have the typical shape that we find of other examples in this category. These two paintings show um, you have the Bodhisattva uh, Samantabhadra riding an elephant on the left and Manjushri riding a lion on the right, surrounded by attending figures. This pair of paintings is distinctive in that they have a curved upper border forming an arch when placed together. It's not clear how they would have been hung but the shape suggests that they were either meant to fit in some kind of vol uh, barrel vaulted space uh, of the type that might be found in Central Asia, or it is meant to simulate the appearance of one. 
So this pair of paintings remain a kind of mystery, but it seems to suggest that paintings like this, there could be a relationship between uh, some of these paintings and architecture. Banners and hanging paintings constitute the majority of the pictorial works from Cave 17 and BM. Another group are drawings and stencils, and some of the drawings are actually just casual sketches, but others are more specifically preparatory drawings used by painters in their work processes, which is a topic that uh, Professor Sarah Fraser has studied in detail in her book called uh, Performing the Visual, and I'm going to refer to it here and then later again about the production of the paintings. So there are different types of preparatory drawings in the collection. The example on the right is very abbreviated and roughly rendered and providing the basic features of a complex composition that is more suitable for conceptualizing the overall arrangement of a large wall painting, while others like the sketch of a lion on the left is finely rendered and provides a clear model for a painter to follow and possibly to modify if they needed to create variations when painting multiple works of a similar subject matter. There are also several stencils in the collection. These are drawings that have pinpricked holes in them for transferring the design onto the surface using a pound. This example on the left is very interesting as it doesn't have an ink outline, but only has pinpricked holes. This suggests that stencils can be made in the multiple by placing several sheets of paper on top of each other and then pricking through an ink drawing that, has, that was placed on the top layer. The stencils like this have been linked to the depiction of the thousand Buddha motif um, that is found on the slope ceilings of the Mogao caves, particularly from the 10th century. And these drawings and stencils provide an extremely valuable glimpse into the working practices of painters in Dunhuang and China more generally. Then there are a small number of paintings in other formats. These include a hand scrolls or items in a horizontal format. Interestingly, there's only one example of a hand scroll in the BM uh, Stein collection that depicts a narrative. And it's this uh, incomplete scroll showing five of the 10 kings of hell where the souls of the deceased are being judged for their good and bad deeds. And interestingly, the Im images here appear without the sutra text. There are other versions that have both text and image. So perhaps the viewer must either have been familiar with the subject matter or he or she would have needed someone to actually explain it to them orally. Then uh, finally, there are booklets and uh, poti. And these formats have been discussed by uh, Dr. Enrique Lambos in his recent book, Dunhuang Manuscript Culture, which is available on open access. Um, and there are more examples of these formats in the British Library, but because of the interesting images on these examples, these have ended up in the British Museum. The poti is derived from the Indian palm leaf manuscript format, and most poti books that survive from Dunhuang are written in Tibetan, so its use in Dunhuang is related to the Tibetan period and its legacy. The booklet is another new format that appears in Dunhuang from around the 9th century, uh, and it's made up of stacked sheets that are folded and sewn together. And these booklets tend to be very small. And this one is only uh, 6.4 uh, centimeters in height, making them portable and easy to consult. Okay, so that's a quick run through of the formats of the paintings in Cave 17. Um, I want to just very quickly mention the prints. There are 30 registered woodblock prints from Cave 17 in the collection. Uh, and these can be broadly divided into two types, ones that are made with repetitive stamping in a ritualized context or with um, blocks, either single block or blocks that have been fitted together. So now that we've run through the types of paintings and prints in the collection, we can turn to ask some basic questions about them. Who made them and who commissioned them and for what purpose? Now, none of the portable paintings in the BM actually has the names of painters inscribed on them. However, from studying the preparatory drawings, um, inscriptions on wall paintings and financial documents, um, it is possible to know something about the overall organization of painters in Dunhuang and their working practices as shown by Professor Fraser. In short, painters in Dunhuang were part of a professional class of artisans and were generally not the same as monks who copied sutras. 
They are part of workshops that were organized according to a hierarchy depending on skill level. And as painting production became more organized, workshops formed a painting guild or professional association that had a manager who oversaw the use of painting materials and also could supervise an overall project. The Painting Guild became the basis for the establishment of a painting academy under the Tao family Gui Jun as early as the 930s. And in the academy system, painters were given court ranks and were employed on standing duty. This coexisted with a more informally arranged guilds uh, structure where painters uh, could be employed temporarily to work on specific projects. In the case of prints, there are actually instances when the names of the woodblock carvers actually appear on the work themselves. And so, for example, at the end of the inscription of this print, it states Jiang Ren Lian Mei, or Artisan Lian Mei, which is a very early example of a woodblock carver's name uh, that has been included in the print. But we also see this um, appearing again uh, two years later in another printed uh, work. And in this occasion, uh, Lei Yan Mei is actually referred to a woodblock carver official. So this shows that just like the painters that came under government organization, uh, it was possible for an artisan to, uh, to, uh, to advance in a kind of a hierarchical position. And interestingly, there's something about the prints and their reproducibility that, um, and the physical act of actually woodblock carving that seemed to differentiate this act from painting and made it necessary at times to make clear the identity of the carver on the prints, which is not actually something we find on the portable paintings. Now, while there is not so much information about individual painters in Dunhuang, there is a bit more information about the sponsorship of portable paintings and prints because of the existence of donor inscriptions and images on some of these works. And these, uh, this information appear, usually appears in the lower part of the painting. And a common arrangement is to have male donors on one side of the painting, female donors on the other side, and then you have a space in between for an inscription. There are also inscriptions that identify the individual figures. And from this, we can know that people of a range of social economic status actually sponsored portable paintings and prints. So we come back to this print, and this print is actually sponsored by uh, Cao Yuanzhong, the fourth military commissioner of the Cao family, Gui Yujun, who governed the region uh, and who governed the region from 944 to 974. It also tells us that this print was dated to the Ghost Festival. This is the time to pray for the salvation of one's ancestors. So Cao Yuanzhong on this occasion have commissioned this print as well as another print of a different subject matter to pray for the well-being of the whole region. And also he refers to himself not only as a military commissioner, but also as grand preceptor or taifu in the title, which was a Chinese a civil official title. And it seems to be one that Cao Yuanzhong actually gave to himself. So by print, printing and circulating multiple copies of this print, as well as another print with very similar a textual content, he is publicizing his position as military commissioner, grand preceptor, and protector of the people of the region. In the VM, there are no examples of paintings commissioned by the Guayu rulers, but there are some examples in other collections, like uh, this painting of um, in the Harvard Art Museum, which was commissioned by Cao Zhongshou uh, as a young man, and he would later become the military commissioner of the Guayu. On the other end of the economic spectrum is this example. This painting depicts uh, Avalokiteshvara. And on the left, we see a line of an inscription recording that this painting was, effort, was offered uh, wholeheartedly, uh, probably to a temple by a shoe mender named Suo Zhan uh, San, so someone of a rather humble profession. It's also, you can see the difference um, in terms of the material and the way that it is painted ways that would make this work more affordable compared to the other works that we have seen. But most of the uh, inscriptions on the portable paintings show us that actually the paintings were sponsored by patrons uh, from the, who were mid to low level officials and their family members, as well as ordinary monks and nuns and lay Buddhist followers. Um, so for example, this painting here 
uh, is the main sponsor of this is the head of a platoon of the Dunhuang Inf Infantry called uh, 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 Zhang uh, Qiaqiao. So there has been suggestion that perhaps the patronage of portable paintings was an affordable alternative to commissioning caves, which was much, uh, much larger projects and requiring far more resources. But the portability of paintings like these that we see on the screen enable them to be displayed in different contexts. So it is possible that um, they were commissioned for reasons beyond being affordable. And perhaps there were more paintings that were once sponsored by elite donors but were simply kept in other larger monasteries in the town of Dunhuang and don't survive in K-17. Now, I'm going to just slightly move ahead. Um, I just wanted to mention that there are in fact some examples of uh, paintings that were sponsored by uh, non-Chinese patrons like this one with Tibetan script on it um, and uh, seems to be judging from the text, uh, seems to be commissioned by a Tibetan woman. And also there are a lot of group uh, showing group donors, but they're not always uh, depicting the people who paid for the painting because they also include deceased figures, as in this case, with the title you see the term Hu, meaning deceased, and these are the deceased parents. And the gaining of the merit from making the offering also extends to the well-being of, uh, of the parents, deceased parents and the afterlife. But interestingly, there are paintings that depict donor images and even leave a space for a donor inscription, yet the space is left unfilled. And this can occur on paintings that are very large, very carefully painted, uh, and that must have involved considerable investment by the patron in paying for the skill and labor of the painters and the cost of the materials. So for example, in this painting, which is considered a representative example uh, from Tang Kiri at Dunhuang. Uh, you can see on the bottom left, there is a, a small female donor figure dressed in Tang style costume. And then on the right, there is a damaged area, but this would have had a male donor figure um, on the other side. And then in the center of this, in the bottom part of the painting is this large cartouche in the shape of a stele that is left unfilled. In fact, there are other cartouches in the painting like here that were meant to, uh, uh, spaces that were meant to uh, give the names of the deities, the bodhisattvas and the monks that weren't left unfilled on the painting. So you do find quite a lot of examples of this in the collection. And one explanation of, for this is that the paintings were produced um, in advance with generic depictions of donors and the cartouches can be filled with, in with text after the works were purchased. Now the implication here seems that is that the paintings with the donor cartouches that are left empty were never used when they were placed in K-17. However, given the limited supply of painting materials and the control over the distribution, such as through the head of a painting association as suggested by Professor Sarah Fraser, makes this scenario seem unlikely. So a question remains regarding whether such paintings actually needed a donor inscription in order for them to be effective, or if the making and presentation of the paintings in themselves was sufficient as an offering and sufficient for generating merit for the donors. So um, this is something that is worth uh, exploring further. Okay, now in the remainder of this talk, I would like to turn to the textiles um, and then also introduce some recent scientific analysis that I have, um, that have been done on them. So there are up to 200 pieces of textiles in the collection from K-17 and the BM. Some of these were part, once part of banners. Those are the components like the streamers and the triangular tops that have become separated from the, uh, the rest of the work. Several of these textiles are very large and impressive. And here we have uh, this um, patchwork textile that shows a range of techniques um, and pattern designs uh, that were available at the time. But many more of the textiles are actually small fragments. And these may have been kept in K-17 as, as this has been suggested to be used as repair material for other textiles or for paintings. 
In recent years, the analysis of textiles from K17 has been an active area of research at the British Museum. And the work really started because of this monumental embroidery that is nearly 2.5 meters in height. And this was uh, lent to the Dunhuang exhibition at the Get Getty, so many of you would probably recognize this. And then in 2018, the embroidery went on loan again uh, to the Nara National Museum in Japan. And conservation work was then needed in preparation for the loan. And this entire process was, do was documented in a series of short films that you can watch on YouTube. This offered an opportunity to closely examine the condition of this embroidery and to analyze the material used in its production. So Diego Tamburini, then Mellon postdoctoral research fellow in the Department of Scientific Research, conducted analysis of uh, 25 small samples actually that were very carefully selected from this embroidery. Um, and he used the technique to uh, separate the sample components in order to discover the dyes that were used to color the embroidery threads. And the results of that was published in this article that you see on the screen. So for example, um, and here we're actually looking at the back of the embroidery. Um, in the conservation process, it was they had to uh, give a new backing to this embroidery. So it gave an opportunity to actually see the back of it. And you can see that actually uh, there, is a, there is a pink, pale pink salmon color that is used in many places on the embroidery. Um, and it's most clearly seen in, on the back right here on the halo. Uh, and this uh, color is identified as a safflower dye. And this is finding is consistent with the extremely faded nature of these areas on the front of the work, since safflower dye is very light sensitive. Also, uh, a small area of purple on the Buddha figure in the embroidery seen here um, is actually found to contain a, a dye Gromwell mixed with a red dye, sepang wood. And Gromwell is believed to be uh, quite costly because it's labor intensive to produce. So which would help to explain its limited use on the embroidery. And in order to build on these promising results, further dye analysis was conducted on 31 textile fragments from K17, including monochrome and polychrome woven silk, as well as embroidered silk textiles. And some uh, samples were taken when non-invasive uh, uh, techniques were uh, not uh, possible to dis determine the dyes used. So. The outcome of this work has been published in these two articles, and they provide information that help to identify dyes uh, in other archaeological textiles, and also to clarify when it is necessary to take samples, uh, uh, necessary to take samples, and or when non-invasive techniques are actually sufficient for identifying dyes. In addition, one of the interesting findings have been the, the of mixture of dyes and the evidence of overdyeing in the textiles from K17 which suggests that textiles could be recycled and possibly re-dyed in, in order to refresh their colors or to create a different hue. So after this, I uh, worked with uh, Diego and also a color scientist, Joanne Dyer, to extend this analysis to a few of the portable paintings because actually the portable paintings also use dyes on the borders, these textile borders that are found on quite a few of these paintings. Um, and uh, and uh, these uh, can come in uh, quite a lot of different colors and also some variety in the design, such as the one you see on the right with strips of silk of different colors, uh, including the loops. So there's quite a bit of um, thought given into the design of the textile borders. In this case, using uh, non-invasive techniques, namely uh, UV light and uh, a technique called fiber optic reflectance spectroscopy, the scientists studied the dyes on the textile borders of several examples. Uh, and I presented a paper on this uh, at the International Association for the Study of Silk Road Textiles conference, and uh, the paper will hopefully be published soon as part of the conference proceedings. So, is some of the interesting findings include, for example, these textile borders on three paintings, um, 9, 16, 23, and 31, 
they all appear to be dark brown in color. So in, uh, in Syringia, published in 20, uh, 1921, Stein actually describes the color of all three works as a faded purple. However, the FRIS results show that Stein uh, 23 and uh, 31 are actually dyed with purple Gromwell, whereas um, Stein 16 is a generic brown color and obtained using tannins. So it's actually quite interesting also that uh, Gromwell, the dye that I mentioned earlier in relation to the very large embroidery, is actually used here on both silk, that is the material of uh, Stein 31, and the hemp material or uh, some coarser material of Stein 23, um, since it's actually quite rare to find um, coarser material like this being dyed with Bromwell in the collection. Then in another instance, the analysis helped us to um, clarify the colors on the textile borders that have faded to an extent that they are no longer visible to the naked eye. So for example, this uh, painting, Stein 63, the hand border looks like a light brown color. You can see a little bit of pink survive in some areas, but overall it's very faded. Now this is confirmed by the analysis, which actually shows that safflower dye was found throughout the hemp border of this work, as well as in the, its middle suspension loop. So uh, this banner in the collection, Stein uh, 156, which is in very good condition, gives us an idea of just how bright this pink salmon color is when it is applied uh, onto hemp uh, fabric. So this is um, the work that has uh, been preserved in very good condition. And so this gives us a comparison that shows us in the original state, this textile border in Stein 63 would have been very pink and it would have strongly echoed the pink tones that you can kind of see that is used extensively in the painting itself. So you can imagine just how bright um, the painting would once have been. Uh, and we found that to be the case, uh, not surprisingly, with quite a, a few of the other works as well, where the colors have faded over time and actually would have been brighter, the border colors would have been brighter in their original state. So this actually gives a, a taste of the possibilities of scientific analysis in better understanding the production of these works. Uh, and it's also one way that we can connect these works to examples across a much wider region, such as in other sites around the Tarim Basin where textiles have been discovered. And through the sharing of uh, the data that is reviewed through analysis, we can maybe learn more about the transfer of mater uh, materials and technologies over um, a wider region in a given period. So scientific analysis will surely be one very productive strand for the study of this material from K17 in the future. Now, another uh, research strand that I will be working on in the coming years is a Silk Road exhibition at the British Museum, as Julia mentioned earlier. And uh, I actually have uh, only got the dates yesterday from the head of exhibition. So what you're seeing on the screen, um, the forthcoming exhibition in September, 2024 to February, 2025, that you are among the first audience to actually hear about these dates. And so it is really happening. Uh, and uh, undoubtedly, the, a selection of the important objects from Cave 17 will feature in the exhibition uh, and part of be able to tell different narratives that is part of the Silk Roads. So now it's still very early stages of the project, but I look forward to be able to uh, share more information about this exhibition with everyone on, on future occasions. So uh, I'll end it here. Thank you very much. Yuping, thank you so much. That was lovely. Um, that was such a clear and cohesive introduction to the collection, which, as you stated, is quite extensive. So we can't thank, thank you. you enough for that. We've had a number of questions coming in as you've been speaking. And if anyone has any further questions, um, you'll note in the bottom right hand corner of the screen, there's a Q&A bubble with two uh, talk bubbles. You can submit your questions there and we'll be able to ask you thing for you. 
So our first question is, where can we find a published image of the Pure Land of Amitabha? Thank you. The Pure Land of um, the one that has not been conserved, is that the one? It's I think it was the one that you showed very early. Uh, yes, there, that is that image is available in collections online. So you just need to type in the museum number that I think is on the part that I gave in the PowerPoint. Um, I can maybe share the screen again just to show you uh, in case you didn't get that earlier. Oh, so, that'd be great. Uh, Thank you. Hmm. Hmm. Here, this one. Is that the one the, the person is referring to? It may have been this one or one of the other images that appeared in the Getty exhibition in 2016. Uh, it's a large silk painting. Um, so, well, they, they are all available on collections online, either that one or as long as uh, you can search, uh, it's easiest searching using the museum number so you can get it directly. But um, this one, number one? Yes, yes. I think it was yes. one in this um, that's not part of the lecture. Uh, um, it's not the Amitabha paradise, but, but anyway, if you, this is the image you're looking for, then this is uh, sign one. So uh, it's okay. put in the full museum number that I mentioned in the lecture which is 1919, 0.1, 0.1. All right, thank you, Yuping. Um, our next question is, are the manuscripts at the British Museum mm. and the British Library cataloged mm. based on the original language that they're written in besides those in Chinese? Um, that we'll have to ask the, the colleagues in the British uh, Library. I think the cataloging process is ongoing. So there are, there, are many, there are multiple different languages, so it requires uh, different linguistic skills to be able to decipher them. But I think a lot of people are working on that, and there are databases uh, with, the, with the manuscripts in their original language. But the manuscripts are in the British Library, so they're not in the British Museum. Okay, we'll be talking about that for the lecture, so stay tuned. <laughs> Okay, um, what role, if any, did Sir, Sir Oral Stein play mm. in the division of the objects he brought mm. back from Dunhuang and elsewhere? Mm. So did he have any say in that? Mm, that's a very good question. Um, actually, uh, once the objects are shipped to uh, London, he was not in London so often because he was still uh, had a role overseas and also his expeditions as well. So a lot of the cataloging um, and all of that was actually uh, dealt with by other people. And then also the division of the collection was, um, although he, Stein was informed of the process, um, it was more a decision that had to be made between the British Museum and the British uh, and the um, government of India or through the India mm -hmm. office, because they were the sponsors of Stein's um, uh, expeditions. So the, the decision, uh, Stein did not seem to have been so involved in that decision was that there were people who were assigned to, to make those kinds of decisions from the British Museum, particularly Lawrence Binion, who was uh, the then um, keeper of the uh, subdivision of the subdepartment of the Oriental Prints and Drawings, uh, because at the time the museum didn't have an Asia department or Oriental department. And then the India office also assigned people to um, uh, look at different, uh, the division of the collection including um, uh, Raphael Petrucci, who is, was a French scholar who looked at the paintings. Um, and then um, uh, uh, Edward Dennison, who was the director of the uh, University of London School of Oriental Studies was also involved in the division of the collection. So yes, there were others who, were, um, who, were, who worked on that. All right, thank you. Um, oh, someone asked um, in, um, on, on that note, I was puzzled by the involvement of India in the Stein collection. Mm. Can you explain why and in mm. what capacity the Indian government was involved mm. in the expedition? Mm. So actually the um, government of India was involved as a main sponsor. Uh, they were um, 
uh, also sponsored Stein's uh, first expedition to the uh, Chinese Central Asia. And then, uh, as mentioned, 60% um, of the second expedition was also funded by them. It's a bit like uh, nowadays governments might fund uh, research projects and uh, research mm -hmm. field trips in, in the same way. But at the time, there was also a particular interest in this uh, in acquiring objects and uh, archaeological finds for collections. Um, and the interest uh, in this region for uh, the government of India, uh, particularly uh, relevant because of the spread of Buddhism um, in these parts and finding uh, evidence of the early spread of Buddhism, and also the interest in the meeting of different cultures in this part of the world. So um, there was, I mean, it was given the proximity, I guess, also of the, the areas, it was something they were interested to support. Um, but it's much like uh, governments are supporting research and field trips today. Excellent, thank you. Um, we had another question about the mm. paintings with the empty cartouches. Now mm. you addressed this earlier, but do you have mm. just, uh, is there, could you expand upon your ideas on that phenomenon, why there are so many paintings with these empty cartouches? Well, it's actually a bit of a mystery. So there's no, um, I think, uh, definitive answer to why that is the case, but it has been observed that many of these paintings do leave empty cartouches. I think it's been um, the, the number of actually inscribed works with Chinese inscriptions on them, number in the several of the tens. So there are works where, where there is just no donor information on them. Um, and so uh, it has been suggested that maybe the painters would just uh, have created generic images. And then once uh, the purpose they were acquired and then for a particular purpose, then someone would inscribe the information onto them and kind of activate the painting, so to speak. But um, as I mentioned, the, because the material are limited in Dunhuang, you, it's hard to actually have silk and hemp even, which are, which are costly material and the, the pigments as well. It doesn't really make sense for a workshop to um, create ready-made paintings and then just store it, uh, store them. It's a huge investment. And actually, um, they may not even have the freedom in, in, in a way to do this kind of very commercial market oriented activity. It doesn't seem to fit with what our understanding of the way that uh, painting uh, workshops were organized at the time. So I just simply raise it as a thought. I mean, it's not uh, well developed at all, but um, if, if it is not ready-made and it's not pre-made, then, um, and then these items were placed in the library cave, um, probably as kind of votive offerings, or, or some would even think that they might be used in a liturgical process, then maybe the donor inscription is not absolutely necessary for them to be effective. I mean, that seems to be, a potential explanation for, um, for, for why these things are left blank. Um, so the painting themselves, and uh, maybe these paintings were, uh, I'm just hypothetically speaking here, um, presented as offerings together with other objects that might have identified the donor. So it didn't need an inscription on the painting to show that it was from a particular donor. It might be other items that would identify that. That's just a speculation because there is no actually definitive answer to this. So I just raised that as a possibility. Okay, thank you. Because I wondered about that myself. So sure. Oh, so we have a somewhat sensitive question. So I will phrase it sensitively. But oh. um, ha have any issues with restitution ever been brought up or come up mm. during the history of the Stein collection? Mm. There has been no official restitution claim from the Chinese government or from Dunhuang Academy on these objects. However, of course, we are aware of a popular opinion about this, and we see this a lot on social media. There's also scholars who've been very vocal about this, and Stein have been very critic have been criticized for his collecting activities. Um, but the the tone of the the um, opinion have kind of shifted a little bit over the over this time because um, there's now more of a recognition that the, the 
the scholarship that has emerged as a result of uh, these objects being in different institutions, and then the availability of images have also made it so much easier to share information and uh, new research with different institutions. So I think a lot of uh, interest now is in the digital and the sharing of information through digital channels. Um, so yeah, that is the current situation. All right, thank you so much, Yu Ping. I know that's always a tricky question. Um, did Stein keep any manuscripts or other objects in his mm. private collection? That's an interesting question. Um, it seems that, uh, well, I, as far as I know, it should be uh, things that have all ended up in public collections, but then there are items that somehow end up in on art markets from time to time. So there is a question of how they ended up in private hands. Uh, I'm not, a, I'm, maybe some other people have done research on this, but I'm not 100% sure how people actually acquire these objects through other means. So for example, um, uh, not long ago, I think the Metropolitan Museum of Art acquired a banner that was recently published by um, uh, Professor Michelle Wang and Susan Whitfield um, and, uh, and an article that, uh, and I think that is a fairly more recent acquisition that was found in the art market. So, so there are instances like that. So there may have been things that appeared or that did not, that kind of left the collection through different means, whether that is through Stein himself or not. But Stein was very meticulous in his cataloging and he was, um, he was really a very serious scholar. Um, it's, uh, and uh, uh, it's sort of judging from the way his actions and his overall sort of career, um, it didn't seem like he was a, the kind of person who would try and sort of have a secret stash that then kind of could give away later on, I don't know. But um, yeah, I, I, it's not a very clear answer. I'm sorry, I'm not really sure what, what the details of this. Oh, that's an excellent point. I mean, I think it gets kind of obscured in the legend, but you know, the, the, the serious nature of Stein's scholarship, you know, is if you learn anything about what his collecting activities, et cetera, that mm -hmm. shines forth. And maybe in all the tales of, you know, trekking through the Tarim Basin, it gets somewhat lost. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Um, could you please introduce a bit more information about the forthcoming mm -hmm. exhibition on the Silk Roads? Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, I'd love to share more information. It is in a very early stage at the moment, so it, 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 um, there's not a huge amount that I can uh, share uh, at the moment. What I can say is that it will be a, a very broad geographically, so it's trying to see uh, the Silk Roads as a um, a phenomenon across a very broad region, and then the and this requires us to kind of narrow down on the period, um, and the period will cover an area that we can include the Dunhua material as a kind of key part of the exhibition. Um, I think the point of the exhibition for us, as, as the discussions are ongoing, is really to try and highlight the complexities of the Silk Roads. Um, and go and also to address the idea that um, that Silk Road as an idea that is is a concept that develops in the modern age as well and in a particular context. So the exhibition, at least I hope, will um, present a kind of more complex view of this the history of these uh, connections between different cultures and also address the Silk Roads as a modern concept. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah. And that segues right into the next question, okay. which is, given the more Eurocentric nature of the term mm -hmm. Silk Road, are there yeah. any thoughts put into redefining or renaming the upcoming exhibition? So following exactly on what you said. Um, sure. Well, I don't think the we, we will be, well, I mean, the, the title of the exhibition is not uh, confirmed because that is a, a decision that is gets decided by many people, many factors and marketing and so on, press, et cetera. Um, but it seems, I mean, the Silk Roads is such a um, well-known term. It's a very popular term. It's um, a term that audiences recognize and uh, readily engage with. So there's very good reason to actually keep this uh, as the exhibition title. But part of it is, uh, is through the exhibition, through the exhibition book and uh, related research, is to um, 
draw audiences in to think that they have a certain impression of what the Silk Roads are about, or you know, standard, maybe more conventional narratives of the Silk Roads, um, and then try and sort of break it down a little bit and show them different aspects and different ways of thinking about this history. So if we can manage to do that, I think that would be, um, you know, a, I'd be happy with that <laughs> ultimately. But um, I think there is good reason to kind of keep the title as the Silk Roads. Yeah, but I, it does give, uh, sorry, I should mention it. I think that is a very important point in terms of um, having very clear definitions of uh, what, the, what the exhibition is about mm -hmm. uh, and um, very clear parameters from the beginning because it's such a broad concept. Right. <clears throat> oh, thank you, Yuping. Um, no, this is an interesting question. How much mm -hmm. of the Stein collection is on public display at the British Museum? I know right now nothing because nobody's there, yes. but. Yeah, thank you for that question. So uh, normally uh, the, the, this material is on display in the uh, Sir Joseph Autumn Gallery of China. Um, and more of the uh, archeological finds from the Xinjiang area is uh, actually on display permanently. And they are used to uh, uh, just, uh, talk about different themes such as, there is a case actually on life on the Silk Roads, um, and there is a, a, case, uh, a case on uh, the introduction of Buddhism to China. So these are kinds of themes that the collection is able to, uh, can be used to talk about these themes. Um, in terms of the Cave 17 paintings and prints, uh, there is a case that is uh, used to show this material, but we only show a, a much smaller number of these uh, items uh, on rotation. So we, we change them every six months. And that is because uh, the light sensitive nature of these objects. Um, as mentioned earlier, for example, the textiles, uh, as more scientific analysis have uh, revealed, actually the, some of the dyes are extremely light sensitive. So like that hemp um, banner with a very bright pink color. I mean, I would be very hesitant to really show that on a very long-term basis because you know, once you put it out there, the color is just gonna go so fast. So we're constantly having to kind of balance the problem, well, the importance of get, put, giving access to audiences who wanna see things, but also the longer term preservation of these objects. So what our decision is that we would put a small number on display on rotation and then for scholars and for people who have a need to look at the actual objects, they can apply to uh, our study room when, when the museum is open to look at the object in uh, our Asia study room. So that is the way that we try and make these things accessible. Excellent, thank you. We have a lot of questions. Um, speaking of dyes, on <laughs> dyes. Um, so you showed uh, Diego Tamburini's research on dyes used in textiles and paintings. Yeah. How difficult is it to determine what types of plant dyes were used in these applications? Um, I should ask Diego to explain this. This is uh, more for the scientists. I think it, he uses a technique um, called um, a special technique that I can't really quite explain because I'm, I'm not the scientist. Uh, but it is very specialized. I think he uses a, 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 that only he has been able to do in, in the museum so far. So, so um, I, I can't quite explain it. I'm sorry as a, as a, uh, as a non-science person, but uh, it, is, it is a specialized skill and requires particular machinery to be able to do this kind of work. Um, the, so it, it has been tricky. And then also the process is actually also having a reference material in order to compare mm -hmm. the results. So that is also the other thing that is needed in order to, so you can find the components from the samples, but then you need to have the, uh, the model samples, the standard samples in, in which to compare those results. Uh, and that's something he also did um, by creating his own kind of uh, set of samples for comparison. So it has a kind of long, uh, is this long process <laughs> of actually uh, getting to the results. But yeah, but do, do take a look at the, the articles that have been published. I think it's, it's really uh, important that the data is published and that we only really do this once, hopefully. <laughs> so because sampling is 
a very, it's a matter that should be taken very, very seriously and to be considered um, very carefully whether it is really needed. So, yeah. So it's like the integrity of the objects above all, same as for the display. Um, I think, yes, I mean, we have to balance again, the uh, access um, to the objects and then our responsibility to the long-term preservation of these objects. All right, thank you. Um, this is a, quite a specific question. Thank you, okay. Anne, for sending this. How many painting borders are dyed with safflower some painted frames for landscape mm -hmm. images in recently excavated 8th century tombs around mm -hmm. Chang'an are red. Was this a standard color for mounting in the Stein collection materials? Thank you. Thanks for that question. Um, I don't have an exact number for you. The, the number of uh, paintings with parts of a textile border that survive is um, maybe, I think, around 60 or so. Uh, textile borders and they they come from different colors from uh, this beige color that we see here and then uh, red is one color that's often you find uh, the kind of purplish color we see here dark brown we see light blue as well there's actually quite a range and then the safflower color uh, can sometimes be from the whole uh, border but then it could be just sections of the border as well so I, I'm not sure how many, but it's not like the, the main one. It's, it, there is a range of colors that can appear on these borders. Um, and it's interesting to hear about these other finds for comparison. Um, in the paper that I'm hoping to publish uh, as part of the conference proceedings, what I suggest is that there is actually a kind of shift over time from um, more planar kind of textile borders to uh, ones that are of different colors, different patterns, sometimes even with printed decoration on them. There seems to be a shift either in aesthetics or maybe in terms of uh, the availability of material that um, maybe let people to actually um, to make them uh, more decorative, uh, to maybe hide the quality of, of the textiles that was available to them. Uh, so that actually that is the part that I try to show in my paper. And it's, what I'm sort of interested in is kind of the shift over time. Yeah. Thank you. I'm very happy to say Diego is in the audience and he wrote in. Oh, okay. So oh, please. Thank you, <laughs> right. Diego. You can explain the excitement. <laughs> he said, um, I can say it's very difficult to identify plants at a molecular level. What you need is to have an exact match with a reference material. So the exact plant you're looking for needs to be in your reference database. He also said, bright reds are usually madder and or sap and wood. Pink is usually safflower. Right. Thank you, Diego. <laughs> Thank you, Diego. Um, so we had a question about um, donors to change topics yeah. slightly. Were any of the donors of these objects monks or nuns, as was the case in Indian Buddhism? Mm, yes, definitely. So you... Oh, did I not have any examples here? Oh, um, so let's see. There are examples. I think here there might be um, an, an maybe. Um, yes, the answer is yes. There are nuns and monks that are depicted in the paintings. Um, actually, maybe. Sorry, I want to see if there is an example I can show you. Um, often they, they could be shown individually uh, as a single donor figure in the painting, or they can be uh, people who are leading the group of uh, family members. So they might be shown um, at the front of the group. Um, yeah, so here we have, I think this is a monk in the beginning of this list, uh, this group of figures. So. Yes, monk, monks and nuns are among the donor figures that are depicted. And they sometimes are, they could be the people who actually maybe pay for the object, but they could sometimes be the uh, recipient of the merit that is generated from the object, that is uh, that is deceased and uh, received the merit that generated from the object. We have a question about the cave, Cave 17 itself. Um, yeah. 
any, are there any plausible explanations why all of these prints, wood blocks, mm -hmm. and fabrics from different time periods ended up mm -hmm. in Cave 17? The eternal that's question. A, that's a, yes, that is the big, big question that I think a lot of people want to try and answer. So it, there are different views about this. Um, so Professor Rong Xinjiang, uh, who wrote an a influential article about this issue, he argues that uh, the material of in, that was kept in Cave 17 were brought together by um, a monk of the Sanjie Monastery, the Monastery of the Three Realms that was located just near the Mogao Caves, and that uh, he found his uh, textual records uh, naming uh, this monk Dao Zhen, who was um, trying to build up this the, uh, collection of the Sanjie Monastery by filling in the gaps of the collection and going into different monasteries around Dunhuang and getting bits and pieces from them to fill out the collection. So uh, including bits and pieces of things that could be used as repair material as his explanation for why you get such a variety of things and um, uh, bits of wood, bits of silk and so on. Um, so in, in his argument, he thinks that this is um, primarily the monastic holding of the three, uh, three monastery of the three realms. Um, and uh, because it was coming from different monasteries, that's why you get such a variety. Uh, but then there are other views. Um, so another view expressed by um, uh, Dr. Emre Galambos and also uh, Sam Van Guy, who uh, argued that it was accumulated over time. So that uh, the, the purpose of the cave actually may have changed over time, such as initially uh, there might have been offering to uh, a, a memorial of a, a monk, Hong Bian, who mm -hmm. sculpture is now placed inside the cave. And that initially objects from very early on might have been placed there for him. And then over time, there might have been items that were uh, votive offerings, like a lot of the banners or repeated sutras copies of the same sutra in multiple in the thousands sometimes. So uh, not so much a library would need so many copies of the same sutra. Um, and as such, they might, might have been just votive offerings placed there. And then there might have been part of it is Dao Jin's, uh, collection. So uh, this is another uh, explanation that it is accumulative over time and serving different purposes over time. So that might be one way of explaining why you get such a variety of of things uh, in, in the collection. And then I guess um, some might still think the sacred waste ex explanation is still uh, reasonable, that maybe that is another way of, of explaining um, the material in the case. So yeah, there's still, this is still very much a mystery. It's still unresolved, but different scholars have presented different views. Thank you, Lupi. Um, I have a question about Oral Stein. Uh, he died in Kabul. Is his mm -hmm. grave still intact? Do you have any information on that? Um, yes, apparently his grave is still intact. I um, recently, there, there is a photo of the, the grave site um, and then somebody on Twitter actually sent a picture of that uh, <laughs> on, online. So I think it is recent. Um, it looks like it is intact. I have not visited it myself, um, unfortunately one day. <laughs> um, we have some uh, questions. Uh, one about, I'm going to, we're getting to the end of our time period here, so I'm going to close down with these two questions. Um, sure. The first is about the upcoming Silk Road exhibition. Will you include the Maritime Silk Roads? Uh, <laughs> that's a, um, we will, I think it is necessary to include some aspect of the Maritime trade and, and exchange because it is a huge part of exchange, uh, of the movement of objects, peoples and ideas during that time. Um, it's the extent of having to, uh, how we balance the, the huge topic uh, of, of the silk roads um, and both the complexity of the land routes and then also the sea routes. So I expect that there, sh I hope that, that there will be uh, parts of the exhibition that addresses it, we may not be able to uh, make it a key, like the major focus of the exhibition because there's just too much to cover, but it is definitely something that we will address um, to an extent in the exhibition. 
All right, thank you. And one final question um, mm -hmm. to everybody whose questions we didn't get to, I apologize in advance. Um, mm -hmm. Please hit reply on your confirmation email for this webinar. We will be able to collect your questions and forward them to you, Ping, mm -hmm. um, later. So if you um, fall into that category, I'm so sorry, we had a lot of questions for you, Ping. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So the final question is, um, are or will the writings from the Silk Road housed in the British Library be available for public viewing, or does one need to be a scholar to gain access to them? I think in this case, it's um, what is available, the, the documents that are in the British Museum, specifically. Uh, the documents in the British Museum, mm. I mean from Cave 17. Yes, from Cave 17. Uh, okay, so the documents you have to go to British Library. That's right. why that is kept. But the items from K17, other items, um, there is a form that you can download online to uh, and then uh, send to the Asia department. Uh, it requires you to explain, uh, give an explanation of why you need to see the object. Uh, and uh, it will actually come to me to actually look at it. Uh, we try to make it accessible to people. And even we sometimes we actually have uh, the paintings and objects on display for students to have classes, for example. So we certainly think it's important to, to make it accessible, um, but we do require there to be some purpose to actually look at the object because otherwise um, it's you can very welcome to look at objects in the gallery. Um, and they are objects from you know eighth century uh, history. So it is something we have to take uh, into consideration when making these decisions. Absolutely. You can thank you so much <laughs> for being with us today, answering all these questions on many diverse topics um, oh, surrounding sure. the collection, the upcoming exhibition, Cave 17 and Oral Stein. Thank you. We can't thank you enough. Pleasure. Really. Thank you. Um, yeah, it was just fascinating, I found, especially to learn about all the varied types of objects that were found in the collection itself. Like it has such a scope. Yeah, and that's was um, makes it very difficult to talk about it as a whole. But then I feel like it, unless we do talk about it as a whole, we'll never really quite understand K-17. I mean, we're only ever gonna see like one aspect of it. So um, yeah, it's a lot to cover. I probably put too much to cover, but, but I hope at least people have like an impression in their minds about what is in the BM and what it gives an impression of what was in the cave as well, in addition to the manuscripts. So I hope that was useful. Exactly, extraordinarily yeah. useful. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. Um, so is, I, yes. Oh, what were you saying? No, no, not, nothing more. Is, is there anything further that we need to uh, finish up here? No, I'll make sure that you get the remaining questions, though. I'll take sure. care of that. So for everybody whose questions came in later, be, be assured they will be sent to you, Ping. Yes, I'm very happy to answer any questions um, uh, afterwards. Please feel free um, to, <laughs> to ask them. <laughs> ask away, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Um, as a note and a related note, our next lecture in this series will be on May 13th, again at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. So again, that's Thursday, May 13th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Our speaker will be Melody Dumi, who is the curator of the Chinese collections at the British Library in London. So for all the people with questions about the manuscripts, please save them. We will be able to answer them. Um, Melody will be speaking on the Stein collection at the British Library, which features 45,000 manuscripts and printed documents. Um, further information on this lecture is forthcoming. So stay tuned, everyone. Um, to our viewers, I'd like to give my sincere thanks for joining us today. You do not know how much we appreciate you, your enthusiasm and your support it means so much to us at the foundation. Um, again, Yuping, thank you for everything. That was an astounding presentation. I learned so much, really. Um, and that's having worked on the Getty show before, I still learned so much. So, yeah. So I'd like to wish everyone a very pleasant afternoon. And until next time, take good care.